I'm Eliza Kozlowski. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing and Engagement here at the museum. And just wish you were here. Evenings are some of my favorites. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, we are fortunate that for 22 years we've been doing this program and it's been made possible by the generous support of a very devoted longtime member, Tom Tischer, um, who I know many of you know through the years. Unfortunately, Tom is not able to be with, here with us tonight, so I'm sorry not to give him a public thank you, um, but we're so uh, appreciative of Tom's support. Um, and I do want you to mark your calendar for next month, so uh, November 17th, we will have our final Wish You Were Here talk with Ed Cashy, so we hope that you come back and join us for that. Um, and it's really wonderful to have Martha Cooper back in Rochester. Um, she's been here more than three times, but three times um, for uh, documenting the murals of wall therapy um, during the wall therapy festival. Most recently this past summer uh, for the 10th and final festival. And if hopefully some of you had the opportunity to see her um, and see the documentary. Um, she's a subject of a documentary made in 2019, um, Martha, a story? Martha, a picture story. Um, and it's really fascinating. And if you didn't have a chance to see it then, uh, you can stream it through Netflix and Apple TV. So I recommend you do that. Um, and I also, I want to have as much time for Martha to share her story. She will, much of what I would say in a formal introduction, she's gonna to touch on because she's gonna really talk you through sort of her, how she first was turned, uh, introduced to photography and her career and it's really a great story and I wanna make sure we have much time as possible. But I do wanna share that Martha is the Kodak girl. Um, she is someone who has deep roots in uh, as far as Kodak and she'll go into more detail of that. Um, has a book called The Kodak Girl. For 40 years, she's been collecting uh, material, uh, some of which she's brought with her to Rochester, and we have a display case that you'll be able to check out after her talk with some of the objects she's brought. Um, but I do highly recommend you go to kodakgirl.com uh, to learn more about her collection, uh, some of the photos, the figurines. It's really, um, it's really a treat to watch. Uh, a, a treat to look at. Um, she's Her work has been published extensively and we're fortunate that tonight we have um, Spray Nation, which is her most recent book. Uh, so we have this for sale in the shop and we will have a book signing afterwards um, and also a chance if we don't get to Q&A or many questions, um, this will be an opportunity too for you to chat one-on-one um, -on -one with Martha. But please uh, join me in welcoming Martha Cooper. So thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here at the, in the heart of Kodak country. Um, you know, to me, this is where it all began in the United States for sure. And I grew up shooting Kodak film and I shot Kodak film for over 50 years, 60 years probably. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I got into photography and what I'm doing now. And let me see if I can, to the next here no nope. made a mistake okay so my dad um, and my uncle had a camera store in Baltimore and I had a camera in nursery school actually and the the picture on the left in that old Kodak slide in the old frame uh, shows me with my first camera which was a baby a baby brownie special it was called in at Bar Baltimore Harbor because my dad used to take me out on what he called camera runs to take pictures and that is basically what I thought taking pictures was supposed to be. It wasn't necessarily to create art, it was just to go around looking for something interesting and snap a picture of it. And basically that's what I still do today. Um, that's my mother on the right, she also worked she was a uh, high school English teacher, but she uh, also worked in the store. And the store was in Baltimore for something like 60 years. So my second camera was also a Kodak camera. It was a Duaflex, and that's me bringing up the rear uh, with the camera slung ar around my shoulder. And this, my dad was a Kodak dealer, and that, wait, this, Kodak um, Dealers Magazine had an article about the store of which he was very proud. 
So this is an example of the kind of thing my dad would take me to when we were looking for pictures. It was a hunt in Baltimore. And he had a dark room in our house and he would print up the pictures that he thought were good. And he sent this picture to a magazine in Rochester. And it's my first rejection. <laughs> but, but they wrote an extremely nice letter, which you probably can't quite read here, saying that the tales of the dogs were too complicated to uh, reproduce well. But it was an encouraging letter. Um, you can see on the back, the back of the photo said I was uh, 13 years old. Um, so if there are any photographers in the audience, you know that getting rejected is something that you really have to get used to. And I got used to it at an early age. Um, however, Kodak, I entered some Kodak contests and was very well received. I won an honorable mention three years in a row for three different pictures. Uh, including this, the one of the, the hounds that got rejected. And 1957, 58, and 59, I won honorable mentions in the National High School contest. And I really do think that that inspired me to be a photographer. So thank you, Kodak. Um, I was very proud of it then. They published a little winner's booklet that had my name in it. And they actually sent me a check. Uh, for fifteen dollars, <laughs> um, I think I have a picture of it here. Those are, see, there's the check, and, and my certificates of merit, and that really, um, I would say, was the start of of my being serious about photography. Um, here I am in high school. I was president of the school camera club, and now I'm going to fast forward. To, I went to college in Grinnell, Iowa, but I did not, there was no photography program. I didn't study photography. I was an art major. And after college, I went into the Peace Corps. I joined the Peace Corps, I went to Thailand, and I took pictures of the hill tribes in the area, in Northern Thailand, and I decided that I wanted to study anthropology. Um, But first I bought a motorcycle and I drove it from Thailand to England. Um, and I went to Oxford and I spent a year at Oxford uh, doing a graduate program in anthropology. And then I applied to National Geographic to be an intern. I had read about this in some newspaper and uh, I was accepted. So that was my first real professional kind of um, well, great, great luck, actually, and training, because they, they provided me with the cameras. And I spent the summer at National Geographic, and I decided for sure that I wanted to be a photographer. And this is one of the pictures that I took that summer. And what's interesting to me about this photograph now is that it is maybe my first, well, it is my first graffiti photo, and graffiti has become a lifelong interest. So uh, looking back on that summer and seeing that I took this picture, uh, it was interesting to me that I noticed the graffiti on the walls. It was also the summer um, when Martin Luther King was assassinated. So it, a lot was going on in Washington that summer. So after that summer, I decided that I wanted to be a National Geographic photographer. And I proposed a story uh, about a a tribe in the Philippines, because I knew the anthropologists who had worked with this tribe. And Geographic gave me some support, and I went off to the Philippines, and I spent maybe six weeks trying to shoot this story, and they didn't use it. They rejected it. <laughs> and that was, at the time, really devastating, because I thought that this was going to be the start of my great career with National Geographic. So plan B, I got married. <laughs> and I married an anthropologist. And he was doing his field work in Japan. So we traveled to Japan, and we lived in Japan uh, for two years. The first year we spent in Tokyo. And um, I, I was especially interested in the arts and crafts of Japan. 
such as and paper making. I did um, a big project on paper making, and the, these umbrellas were made with handmade paper. And I also photographed. Um, these are that's a what was called a pusher. Had nothing to do with being a drug dealer. Pushing <laughs> at rush hour, they actually had pushers to shove the crowds into the crowded subway cars. Um, but again, when I look back on these pictures, I'm interested to see that I, I, was, I took pictures of subways because that has also been a lifelong interest. Um, while I was in Japan, I used to go around to different festivals and I saw a tattooed man at a festival. And I got interested in Japanese tattooing. And so I did a big project and Again, I tried to get these pictures published, but at the time, tattooing was such an underground art form that I couldn't, nobody was interested in the pictures. However, 40 years later, <laughs> I was able to publish a book, and I'm sure, as a lot of you know, that J Japanese style tattooing today is very popular. Especially in New York City, I see people with these full body tattoos a lot. Uh, but again, I guess I was just too early. So um, I moved with my then husband, no longer husband, um, to Rhode Island because he took a job uh, at the University of Rhode Island and I decided that I would be a newspaper photographer. And I got a job with the Narragansett Times. And this was a weekly newspaper, but they really uh, used good pictures, they used them well, they printed them, it was an offset press, pictures look good in the paper, it really gave me, um, it gave me experience shooting all kinds of different things and also uh, I had a good portfolio from these pictures. But the Narragansett Times was, I, I set my sights on the New York Times, so I decided to move to New York. Of course I never, I never got the job with the New York Times, but I did move to New York. Um, I got a job with the New York Post, not the New York Times. And for three years, I was uh, this, on the staff, a staff photographer of the New York Post. Um, that's me in the middle. I was the only woman uh, staff photographer at the time. And again, this was incredible experience for pretty much any kind of um, photography because you're running around uh, all different kinds of assignments. You never knew what the next assignment was going to be. Uh, you had to be prepared. You had to have your equipment ready. And up and I was shooting Kodak film. You know, I'd be shooting Tri-X. So, you know, we were shooting. This was um, Three Mile Island when there was uh, a nuclear leak. I was shooting all kinds of news and a lot of celebrities. Here you see Muhammad Ali, Sophia Loren, Salvador Dali. I mean, celebrities were uh, the bread and butter of the New York Post. But for me, I was most interested in feature pictures that I would find along the way, um, such as this one. And these are the kinds of pictures that they would put into the newspaper whenever there was like a slow news day or a space. And I was always looking for uh, these pictures. And wh while I was at the Post, I went on vacation to Haiti. And I saw these kids making their own toys. And I decided that when I got back to New York, I would look for similar subject matter, see if I could find kids that were playing in a creative way, um, making their own toys, uh, not, sp not toys that you needed to buy. And this is another, this, this little boy was making um, kites, obviously, to sell. So at the time, the, the post was on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and it was a wasteland. There was just block after block after block of bond out buildings and vacant lots. And I would pass through this area, it's called Alphabet City, if you know Manhattan at all, avenues A, B, C, and D. And I would drive through Alphabet City on my way down to the post, which was south of that. And I would look to find kids that were just out there having fun, making things, doing things. Like these kids were building a little house. 
these kids had a club in an abandoned building. This little boy was making a go-kart. Another little boy was writing his name on the street. And one of the, sometimes I would see the same kids over and over again. And the little boy here who was flying a pigeon, he had a pigeon coop on the roof, uh, showed me that he had a notebook of drawings. Uh, and he said, why don't you photograph graffiti? And I actually had never really looked at graffiti. I hadn't really understood what it was. You would see a lot of graffiti all over the, the walls, but it was sort of hard to read. And it didn't really, I was used to say political graffiti, but this, this graffiti didn't really say anything. But he explained to me that he was practicing his name, his nickname, which was He Three, to put on the wall. And he's, he's posing with that book. And when I said I was interested, he said he could introduce me to a king. And the king turned out to be Dandi, who in fact was considered a graffiti king. And the picture on the right here was a picture taken by my friend Susan, because I, was, I took her with me. I was afraid they were going to steal my equipment. And I went to visit Dandi. And he actually turned out, I mean, he was incredibly knowledgeable and patient and he explained everything about graffiti to me and he really got me interested in photographing graffiti which is something I still do today. Um, the, when I first met Dandi, the reason why he even would talk to me was that he had clipped this picture from the post and put it into his sketchbook and this was a what I didn't realize at the time was that you could identify any piece of graffiti on a wall. And this was the background of the little girl on the swing is his piece. He had written that. And, and CIA on the right hand side, that stood for crazy inside artists because they were tagging inside the train. That was his crew. And so he had, he had clipped this picture out of the post and, and it had my credit line on it. So when he was introduced to me, he saw me as he, he realized that I wasn't a cop and that I was somebody who could um, maybe get him some fame because graffiti writers always fame was the name of the game. So um, he invited me to to come back to his apartment when his friends were drawing in their notebooks, which is what they did before they went to the yards. They actually designed the pieces that they would put on trains. And I spent a day with him. That's a, it's, a, it's called a black book or a peace book. And then finally, uh, I went to the yards. And you can see he's holding his sketchbook in his hand. And um, I watched as he painted this whole car. And so what? this is the picture of what the car turned out to look like. So what people thought were kind of random acts of vandalism actually turned out to be extremely carefully planned acts of vandalism. <laughs> <And> <laughs> well, imagine what you would have to do um, to paint this piece like in, in one night. And you have to think ahead about which colors you want to paint it in. And then you have to procure the paint somehow which didn't usually mean paying for it. And um, this was, and he named the piece Children of the Grave. Uh, I think this one was part three. There was, he had a series, Children of the Grave. So and this is called A uh, Whole Car Top to Bottom. And it's, of course, says Dandi. And the character of Dandi was a figure from an underground comic book by an artist named Vaughn Baudet. So this is what the South Bronx, that picture was taken in the Bronx. This is what the South Bronx looked like at the time, like the Lower East Side, totally bombed out. And I began spending hour after hour after hour going up to the Bronx and trying to catch these amazing trains as they ran above ground so that I could see them. Before, as, as they got into Manhattan, they would be running underground. And Dandi, um, lived in Brooklyn, but these trains were in the Bronx. Writers like, they call themselves writers, not artists, graffiti writers, because they're writing letters. Uh, they like to write on lines that traveled throughout New York City. So a train that was painted in Brooklyn could
could go uh, across through Manhattan and into the Bronx so that while the Bronx writers might not know the Brooklyn writers, they knew the work of the Brooklyn writers and they knew the reputation of the Brooklyn writers. And this is, it was a very exciting time <laughs> to be taking these pictures because people really didn't understand what was going on with graffiti. They hated it, uh, they criticized it, but they really weren't really looking at it. Uh, these two cars say Duster and Lizzie in two different styles, straight letters and wild style. Uh, and Duster and Lizzie were a couple, a girl and a boy, and they purposely wrote, these two cars had consecutive numbers on them, and so that meant they would not be separated. So they, they chose the two cars to put these two pieces on and purposely wrote them in two completely different styles. And they, they both say Duster and Lizzie, straight letters, and the one on the right said that w that's an example of what's called wild style, if you don't know anything about graffiti. Um, this is a train by uh, a very well-known writer today named Futura, and he called this his break piece because he was breaking away from the tradition of writing letters on a train. So it's an abstract piece that he put on a train. Uh, so while I was working for the Post, I was, I was still working for the Post, I was sent to the northernmost part of Manhattan um, to photograph what was supposed to be a riot here. And I wasn't really allowed to take pictures because the kids were all underage, but they had arrested a whole batch of little boys, and the cops told me that they had been dancing, and then they had been fighting about who had won. Uh, well, and this is what they had, <laughs> this is what they had confiscated from them. Uh, but I saw that they had confiscated markers and spray cans, so that instantly made me interested in what they were doing. And when the cops let them go, I asked them to show me what they had been doing, and they uh, showed me this dance. And I mean, the cops had said to me they can spin on their heads, and that just really intrigued me. So I began to follow them, and of course it turned out to be breaking or break dancing. And I was able to do this. I contacted a dance writer with the Village Voice, and I did this piece. Uh, and these, are, to my knowledge, as of today, um, these are the first pictures anybody has ever taken of breaking. This is still a huge phenomenon worldwide. Um, there's going to be a big, it's called the BC Red Bull BC1, is in Manhattan um, in November, this November. Uh, this year is considered the 50th anniversary of hip hop and breaking is a big part of that. And these, this article basically introduced the dance to the world. Um, so this is an event that soon followed because of the article at Lincoln Center in New York, a break dancing event. Um, this is an early movie that I shot the stills for called Wild Style, which included the same kids that I had photographed. Um, and these, some of these are still very much in the scene today. The two in the foreground here, uh, the boy on the left, Doe's is also a well-known artist, as well as a dancer. And Ken Swift on the right is um, one of the most famous b-boys or breakers in the world, he travels all over the world. So, um, meanwhile, I was still trying to work for National Geographic. <laughs> I thought it was my dream to work for National Geographic, and I really was trying very hard. And I finally was assigned this story, and the story was pollen, <laughs> which wasn't really <laughs> what I was interested in. But I tried my best, um, and it was it did. It was a cover story, my only cover I ever got for Geographic. And um, this was another, I did a lot of archaeology stories for National Geographic. But I think my heart wasn't really in those. And I have to say today, the only time I ever use these pictures that I took for National Geographic are when I'm showing them at a presentation like this, 
Whereas the other pictures, the pictures of graffiti and the pictures of the break dancers, I'm using them all the time. Um, they've been published all over the place. I use them in exhibits. I don't put any of the National Geographic pictures in any exhibits, for example. I don't think I've ever printed them. They gave me back all the ones they didn't use. I have boxes of them, all, all Kodachrome slides, by the way. Um, so, I mean, if you're to photographers out there, I'd say, you know, this, it's a lesson, which is basically to follow your interests because, um, you know, that's what lasts in the end. Uh, this is, you know, a, a huge event that I went to in Germany, the Battle of the Year. And then I, at that event, I began to see girls breaking, and I hadn't really seen any before. So I decided to do a book about the girls, and I traveled around doing that. That became Weeby Girls. Uh, the book is credited with United, uniting the B-girl scene, and now there are B-girl battles as well as B-boy battles in all the major breakdancing events. So that was successful. The book was not successful, but the, <laughs> the book is, was remaindered and is out of print, but the, the girls are still breaking. Um, so I was from Baltimore, as we mentioned, and I decided I wanted to do, to get back to doing some street photography. And I decided to do it in Baltimore. And I went around and I, I looked at different neighborhoods and I wound up choosing a 10 block radius in a neighborhood uh, in Southwest Baltimore. It's a neighborhood, I don't know if you've seen The Wire, but it's the neighborhood that The Wire is based on, so it was a neighborhood that was full of drugs and murders and crime, but also a lot of uh, interesting historic buildings and a lot of street action, which is what I was looking for. And I spent 10 years going back and forth from New York to Baltimore, uh, taking these pictures, trying to, uh, trying to meet the residents of the neighborhood. Uh, of course, photographing, if I saw any graffiti or wrapping or breaking, I would photograph that. Um, these are all pictures in Baltimore, in Celebo. And while I was there, um, here, let's see. These are all Baltimore. Yeah, I mean, whoever sees kids eating crabs on the street, but crabs are really a specialty of Baltimore, but I think it's unusual for to find kids that would even want to eat a crab. You know, um, this, these are called a robbers. They travel around with a horse and cart. So I was looking for things that were traditionally Baltimore. Halloween. <laughs> Christmas. Uh, the Barnum and Bailey Circus would come. This, of course, no longer uh, happens. Uh, Peta um, made a big fuss about the elephants, but at this time the elephants would parade through the streets to the uh, arena where the circus was held. Um, and there was street art in Baltimore, and I got invited to a street art festival. Um, this, this is a wheat paste by Gaia who is, that's my photograph up on the upper left and he, he did a piece of art from my photo. As is this, again, that's from one of my Baltimore photos in Baltimore. And one of the artists who came to Baltimore was from South Africa. And he invited me to a street art festival in, South, in Johannesburg. And I went to Johannesburg, and he, as part of the festival, he took us all to Soweto. And Sowebo had been named after Soweto. And so I went to, after going to Soweto, I decided that I wanted to do a comparative documentary project uh, with Sowebo, Southwest Baltimore, and Soweto, Southwest Township. And you can see the guy on the top, he's in, that was in Soweto. The kids on the bottom, their t-shirt reads Suibo. Um, 
Mandela on the top there and the Martin Luther King and the Martin Luther King parade. So I was looking for comparisons. And you have to kind of read. I didn't always organize them in the same manner. So you have to look twice to see which are Soibo and which are Soweto, purposely. Um, but this was, I, I think I went to South Africa four times to do this project. I, I got an artist residency in Soweto. And they were very helpful in getting me you know, around the city and introducing me to people and explaining what I was doing. So you can see a lot of similarities. And this is another project that I haven't had much luck publishing, <laughs> but hopefully I'll be able to get it out there. Um, I did publish a little zine myself. That's what this is from. And Suibo Soweto. And there was graffiti in both places. Two different games. And there you can see graffiti. This is Soweto graffiti on trains. So something that I thought was a, a New York City phenomenon. When I was photographing graffiti, I just thought this could never happen anywhere else. And I was so wrong about that. Uh, this is uh, graffiti is being painted on trains all over the world, including South Africa. Um, this is another, so here are just some of the, fa street art and graffiti has just spread across, people are calling it the biggest art movement in the history of the world. And in fact, that may be true. Uh, it has spread everywhere. And here are just some of the festivals that I've been invited to. Uh, this is Festograph in Senegal. This is called the Ono'u Festival in Tahiti, which I was invited to three times. Graffiti Jam in China. Uh, this was a project in Haiti. This was in Mongolia. So, I mean, I thought that I wanted to be a National Geographic photographer and travel the world. Uh, it turned out that I am traveling the world. And I just, it was just through a different set of circumstances. And I'm much happier. Because uh, when you're a National Geographic photographer, you really have to come up with these. It's, there's a lot of um, pressure to come up with extraordinary photographs. At least that's what I found. That, um, and when I, go, when I go to these festivals, everybody's very welcoming, and I can just take whatever pictures I want. And I, right, that suits me. Uh, this festival I went to this year in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's called Kingraf for Kinshasa Graffiti. And just last week, so not only am I traveling the world, I'm also traveling around the United States. Just last week, I went to a festival in Kansas where I saw this, what I consider amazing and absolutely beautiful piece on a former flour mill. So it, it doesn't, these st street art pieces do not just have to be on walls. They can be on anything, really. And this, this has become, this is Salina, Kansas. I'd never been to Kansas before. Um, it's become a centerpiece of the town. It's, it's a tourist attraction in Salina, so, uh, and well-deserved. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it goes right around the whole building. It's amazing. Uh, so now a lot of my pictures I see in, as I'm traveling around, people have used them in their artwork, and that's kind of fun. Like, that's one of my Japanese pictures reinterpreted by um, Lady Aiko, a Japanese who lives in Brooklyn. Here's Nasa is from Argentina. He sent me that record. Uh, this is Shepard Ferry, who did the Obama portrait. He shepherdized that picture of uh, the boys from 
my street play project. And he put a great big paste up on a wall in New York. This is, you can see the wild style. I just came across the, the flyer in Berlin where they, they used my picture, but they pasted different faces on it. <laughs> Obviously without my permission, <laughs> but, but you have to laugh. I mean, it is funny. Uh, and then just this year, I went to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, and I had an exhibit with Wagner Wags, who had contacted me. Uh, he had been doing painting jackets from my photographs. And I'm actually wearing a jacket here that, that he painted, that he sent me. This, and the, the jackets are actually made, uh, they're, not, they're not like commercially made. They're made by a, a friend of his, they're the vests. And they're really beautiful. So, let's see. And here we have an example of wall therapy in Rochester in 2012. <laughs> yeah. Hal and Nazem, these are twins. And this was a, that was the first year that I came to wall therapy. And on the right, you can see stencils that they've cut from cereal boxes that they use on the wall. And one of the reasons that I enjoy taking pictures of street art and walls being painted is that I love to see all the different tools and techniques that people are using. Um, when you see a finished wall, you have no idea how, it, the, how that wall got there. It's, and sometimes the, the tools are ingenious. And I really did like these stencils that they had cut from cereal boxes. And this is also in Rochester. <laughs> this was uh, the first year I came. And this is uh, a poster that on the left, you can see a Kodak Girl poster that I own because I collect, I collect uh, Kodak ephemera, posters, postcards, film wallets. And Case McLean, a German artist who was one of the artists in wall therapy that year, reinterpreted it and he turned the film into a coffin because film is dead so sadly um, and that's I don't know if that wall is still there it is oh okay you can see and of course he carefully chose a wall the the classic Kodak building is is in the background um, he did do a beautiful job. This is this year. I was here earlier this year, but I did not get to, this is a very well-known street artist, Connor Harrington. It's the beginning of a beautiful wall. I didn't get to see this wall. I hope to get to see it tomorrow, finished. Um, it's, it's sad when I have to leave a place and I have only got half a wall, because. <laughs> Um, but yeah, ha, um, has anybody seen this wall? I mean, this wall is it's out there and it's beautiful. And he's, he's really, really very well known. So I still have tons and tons of slides. I was shooting slides for 50 years, all Kodak slides, yellow boxes like crazy. And the book that we were just talking about, Spray Nation, uh, the person that published that book wanted to publish uh, my unpublished graffiti pictures. And he came to my studio. He took these boxes like this of just random slides and really went through all of them. It's like an, an incredible job. It was something I never would have done myself. Then he had to scan them. He laid them out. He organized them. And that's what the book Spray Nation is. Uh, that just came out. I would never have done that book. I just would never, and I have other boxes like this. This, it's unwieldy. It's hard to handle this. Um, like, what do you do with so many slides? Uh, these, are, these are the books that I've published. 
so far, not including Spray Nation. This is one of the things that I've done with, I made an installation of, of slides, instead of just throwing them away, because I, had, I used to just toss what I considered the rejects into a plastic bag, and, but then I couldn't quite bring myself to throw it away. <laughs> so I made this installation where people could buy them by the pound. And <laughs> there was a scoop, there's a scale there, and there was a light box. They could look at that. And then, then they were instructed, uh, there was a copyright stamp. Before they could buy it, they had to stamp it with my copyright. And they were all what I considered rejects. So as we were saying, I've had this big collection. When I first saw, I saw an ad, a Kodak ad at a flea market that had the Kodak girl in it, and I was immediately um, attracted to this idea of a woman with a camera. And Kodak really did use a lot of um, pictures, images of women using cameras. Really wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ads. And I began to collect them. You can see the one on the right, it says, yours truly, the Kodak girls. And the other one, the Kodak girls at the World's Fair. I mean, they showed women seriously uh, taking pictures, not just looking pretty and holding a camera. And that's what my collection is. And I also collect the film wallets. And that's what, if you look outside, I brought a, a whole batch of my film wallets. So with, with a lot of Kodak Girl images on them. They're in a case outside. So have a look at that as you go by. And so I now I've published a book with my collection called Kodak Girl. So I consider myself Kodak Girl. <laughs> no, I was inspired by the, the idea of Kodak Girl. I love the idea of Kodak Girl. My email is uh, Kodak Girl. I mean, right from the very, I've only had one email since 1998, and it's always been Kodak Girl. And I also have a website, kodakgirl.com, and Kodak gave me permission to use the Kodak name, just in case you're wondering. I have, I have written permission. Of course, they gave me permission for 10 years, and it's now been 20 years, but <laughs> I don't think they, they're, they're going to remember that. Um, so that's, that's the costume that I've been wearing to the Halloween parade for the last 10 years. I kind of change it up a little bit every year. I go dressed as a roll of Veracrome pan. So. And that's, that's me here. This is, that's. <laughs> We do time, okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, Martha, that was fast. Didn't I tell you we were in for a treat? Um, I think we have a handheld mic, but until then, we do have some time for fo uh, for some questions. So if there are any questions, oh, there's the mic. Um, we do want to capture the questions on the mic because we are recording, and so it's helpful to have all of that. So if you have any questions, you're going to raise your hand. Thank you very much. Um, my sister and I went to Bushwick recently, ah, okay. and that was wonderful. Have you been there at all? Yes, you know, they have the Bushwick Collective. That's one of the hot, it's very hard to find a wall in New York City to paint for a street artist, but there's uh, somebody that started the Bushwick Collective. And yes, it's full of street art. It's wonderful. If you go to, I would definitely recommend going there if you're interested in street art, if you go to Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn, not Manhattan. My understanding is it was very intentional on Kodak's part to have young women photographing. If you go back in history, it was all men who dragged around the big heavy equipment and did the processing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea to bring photography to the masses, and especially to half of the population that was female, that normally wouldn't have dealt with mechanical things, exactly. was a very intentional, as far as I understand, a very intentional part of their advertising philosophy? Well, I mean, it, it is unusual for the time. And not only did they show women carrying these heavy cameras, but they also showed them um, developing the film. 
I have lots of ads where they're in the, you know, they're, they're hand developing film and they're making the albums, like pasting the photos in albums. So I think they saw women as the ones that are, were really wanted to preserve family history. And I think they were, that was, if George Eastman thought that up, that was very smart of him. This was one of the best presentations, Martha. I'm sorry Tom isn't here to see it. It is really oh, terrific thank you. and <laughs> informative and easy to understand. And my question is, lots of graffiti, I think, is intentionally not easy to quickly grasp, despite the fact that it might not be on a moving train. What's your um, experience or what have you learned from the artists from knowing them about their intentionality and maybe disguising their work or some of their um, attempts to almost make it mystery? Yeah, I mean, wild style writing. Remember, graffiti writing, when we're talking about, they, there's a movement now to stop calling it graffiti and to call it style writing. And style writing really uh, is, is an appropriate term for what it is. And they're trying to, it's a bit of a competition, trying to outdo each other with styles. But the styles, I won't say obliterate the work, but make it extremely hard for outsiders to read. And even though I've been trying to read it for, you know, how many years, 40 years or something, I still can't read a lot of the wild style. So yes, in a way, it's, it, it's intentional, but, but graffiti writers who are in the know can read it and instantly recognize the style. Um, the idea is that you have your own style, and it's a recognizable style, and you put that up as many times as you can. And so it's, you know, for people who are around, they, they can look at a piece and, and recognize it. So I often have to get I take pictures and then I have to get somebody else to read it for me. Just curious, um, have you ever tried your hand at writing yourself? You know, just a little bit and it is so hard. I, I suggest everybody, if you're all interested, because controlling a spray can, you know, there are many different caps that you can put on the can. They're exchangeable caps and they make wide sprays and, and narrow sprays, but just to control the pressure of the can it's uh, yeah i've tried it a little bit and it's really hard so um i mean just it takes a lot of skill to pull off a really good piece and i think people don't understand that but if you even try just once to write your name you get it more Thank you for this fabulous presentation. But now, is there Martha Cooper saying, gee, I wish I had done that, or I did this and look at what happened uh, that I didn't expect. And we, we saw the documentary, The Little. I remember uh, something that you said about taking pictures and sharing it with the people whose picture you had taken. Yeah. And that's a great story. If you would like to tell it, I'd love um, to hear. Well, especially when I was doing the Baltimore thing, but actually, I. I do it a lot. For example, I just last month was in Florence to do a project. It was called Gap Project, Graffiti Art in Prison. And we had permission to take pictures of some graffiti workshops in the prison. And I went to the local Xerox store and I made Xerox copies because that was a quick way of making prints. And I brought them back and I gave them. And they, people were so grateful for that. And when I was in Baltimore, I would buy a thousand at a time, four by six prints online. You could, because there was a good deal if you bought a thousand. And, but I would, I would, you know, upload pictures and get the prints and take them back to Baltimore. And I've been inside people's houses where they framed those little prints. And, um, you know, in this day and age of digital photography, I think we forget how much a, a simple print can be appreciated. I mean, not everybody has a computer to look at digital. You know, you can't just send your the shot that you take with your phone uh, to their computer to their phone. Even if they have a phone, 
I mean, are they really going to download that and they, they don't have a computer to download it? Anyway, I, I'm, I like prints. I'm old school and I like prints. <laughs> Thank you. Just a fascinating discussion. Appreciate it. I have two questions that are kind of similar. When you travel the world and you see someone else is taking advantage of your work and they've created something else, do you introduce yourself say, you know, that's mine? It, and the second question is, in your, your street photography, do you ask those people permission to take their image? Good questions. <laughs> um, when I'm traveling the world and I, I see pieces, sometimes they come up to me and they, they, they do know who I am. Um, and other, other times, no, I, you know, I might happen to see, uh, like some of the pictures that I showed, I, I actually have never met the person that did them. But, but I'm flattered that they did it. I don't mind that at all, that they did that. I, I might mind it if I saw it, that Adidas had made a t-shirt from one of those pictures. But uh, I certainly don't mind seeing a pic, a, somebody a paint, painting on a wall from one of my pictures. Uh, asking for permission? I don't always ask for permission. <laughs> um, it, that really is a gray area because when it comes to publishing them, you're always, I, I am worried sometimes about um, will somebody sue me for this? Because even if, you know, if you're editorially, you're allowed to publish pictures that you take on the street, but if somebody decided that they didn't like what you published and they got a lawyer, it costs a lot of money to get a lawyer to, to fight the case, even if you're correct. But I don't, I, sometimes I ask, but sometimes you kind of ruin the picture if you ask. <laughs> sometimes I take the picture first and ask later. So, depends. There's no, I definitely do not carry model releases around with me and ask them to sign a release. I would never do that. Well, thanks for a really informative, I really enjoyed it, and I appreciate that you talked into the mic. I was wondering, I, I saw one thing, you talked about Selena, Kansas, using something that wasn't a flat wall or whatever. Are you seeing other things like that mm -hmm. that people are working with? Yeah, and that that artist has done more than one of those kinds of things. But yeah, there, I've seen uh, street art on containers, for example. Um, yeah, that, you know, all, and you know, it doesn't have to be painting either. I mean, there are street artists working with yarn. For example, there's street artists working with tiles. Uh, there's street artists working doing metal installations now, and sometimes big ones and illegally too. Um, so yeah, I think people are experimenting with all different kinds of things. But that Salina, Kansas one, I thought, I, like I have one criticism was that, is that sometimes the art does not fit what I consider fitting the neighborhood that it's placed in. And the artist maybe flies in, does a piece, leaves, and then the people have to live with that piece. In, in the, and, and sometimes the subject matter just doesn't fit. And, and it's not always the artist's fault because maybe they didn't understand, they had to think ahead and they prepared a piece and maybe they didn't understand what the neighborhood was like. Uh, and then they, they're only there for three or four days and they, they've already requested their colors, for example, so they can't really change it. But sometimes I feel like it doesn't fit. And that, that piece I thought was magnificent. I thought it fit perfectly. The town loved it. It was the, the kids were doing Ring Around a Rosie. It was from a photograph that a local person had taken. Um, they were actually local kids that he was painting. And it was subtle. It wasn't. It didn't like scream out at you. And it just. I thought it just was magnificent. It was to me that was like the best example of what street art could be. It fit perfectly. So, but yeah, there's all kinds of stuff happening. It's that people paint on the ground. Actually, I don't know if this is um, the right question to ask to end all this. But what is your thought about people? creating art over other people's art. I seem to be finding that a lot around here where I see this beautiful art and then the next time I look, 
somebody's initials are over it or whatever and it, it makes me a little sad so I was just wondering what your feeling was about that and if you talk to other artists or writers and what's their feeling about seeing if their work actually gets covered over well <laughs> <laughs> this is I mean controversial in, in, in graffiti culture going over you're not supposed to go over other people's work but People do go over it, especially if there, there are all kinds of battles going on between different kinds of graffiti members. Probably, you know, it's this work is ephemeral. It doesn't last forever. And generally, a piece will stay up for maybe a year, and then people start going over it. And that's where I come in. I, if, if it lasted forever, I would not be interested in photographing it. For me, the fact that it's ephemeral and that I can get the picture when it's fresh and new and I know that it's not going to last forever, then I feel like um, it's part of some kind of historic preservation. And, and the photograph almost always lasts longer than the piece. So luckily now everybody has cameras. So it's, yes, it's sad when a nice piece gets gone over, but another, you know, presumably the artist had a photograph of it. Maybe one that I took. <laughs> Thank you. And I think that was a perfect one to end on. Um, Thank you, Martha, again. And I just want to echo what Sally said about this being really a wonderful presentation. I think you certainly have way more slides than Tom Tischer, but as I shared with you, he's he has hundreds of thousands of slides, would have appreciated this. Thankfully, we videotape all of these, and now we create them and put them out on our YouTube channel, so Tom will be able to watch it. Um, and you will be able to watch it again if you'd like, or to share it with friends, and we encourage you to do so.